Hey guys, I'm uh, introing my interview with Mike Pondsmith because as soon as we sat down, we started talking and I didn't even get a chance to really uh, intro the video right away. I, I did it about a minute in because he was kind of like, are we doing an interview now? And I'm like, yeah, let's just go with it because it was a good, it was a good conversation that we were having and I figured I'd put it in. There was even more after I finished the interview that we talked about because we were just kept talking, but I cut that out because... I might do like a cutting floor video where I put in some of the stuff we talked about after after I ended the interview. Um, so that's just kind of what I wanted to kind of preface this with that. Um, uh, stick around on the channel, subscribe because I've got a Jumpstart Kid unboxing I'm going to do. I'm going to do a Gen Con recap, my thoughts on what was going on at Gen Con. And then I also have a um, Art Osorian at Gen Con News video that I want to do because there was a lot that was going on, a lot of things that were unannounced that I want to talk about. So here's my interview with Mike Pondsmith. Oh, walk seven miles already. Excuse, what a day. Yeah, dude, it's so crowded here, it's crazy. Yeah, it is. So like, uh, I was going to try and do some recording, like, just like, you know, have like a Gen Con video. I was like, there's no room, man. No, no. I just look at this and go, it's better than E3. Never been. I'd like to, but... E3 is worth doing once. Uh, after that, it, it, you know, everybody, the first time I, I went, uh, I, I led my team of Microsoft guys over there. And it was like, oh, wow, E3, year two. Oh, crap, E3, year three. Oh, jeez. How many have you E3? been to? Hmm? How many E3s have you been to? Seven, eight. Wow. Yeah. Just for like other games that you did when you worked at other uh, games I did when I worked at Microsoft. There was two that I was uh, headlining on, you know, as, as uh, lead, and then um, in between shows uh, there was one, a couple I did which uh, were with other studios and other studio, and then uh, recently CDPR, yeah. where I'm not showing up because we normally don't have a booth there, but I'm showing up and talking to people and you know stuff, stuff like that. And uh, actually, last year, the year, this year, E3s, where uh, CDPR, we, we built an entire bar. In fact, each year it's a different bar from the Cyberpunk universe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen, and yeah, they look awesome. There's some great pictures of me doing bartending there. I with, thought it was know. cool when they did the, they put actual bullet holes in the, that yep. was pretty cool. Uh, well, God knows. They, they don't mess a, around. <laughs> well, they have a whole arsenal upstairs in one of the floors where they design the weapons. It's really funny. When I first started talking to them, they brought me in at one point. They said, Mike, we have the weapons. And I looked at the weapons. I said, they're like all silver ray guns. And they're going, yeah, they're science fiction. I said, no, 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 no. You don't understand. Cyberpunk guns are big, black, threatening, and scary yeah. from the beginning. They are not friendly. They are not stylish. They are large masses of death. Yeah, so when you went into that, did you already have, like, uh, actually, red in mind? Actually, interviewing? Yeah, we, I mean, we might as well just keep, keep it going, yeah, keep you know? keep it going, eh? <laughs> I mean, I'm Luke from uh, thedarkfeature.com. And I'm, I'm Mike Ponsmith from Martel Story and Games. The I'm the guy... <laughs> I was about to say it. The who guy killed who killed your, your cyberpunk, cyberpunk character. character. He's creator of Mechton, Cyberpunk, Teenagers from Outer Space. Am I missing a whole bunch? Yeah, there's a lot, yeah. but, you know, who cares? We want to see Cyberpunk. Yeah. So, like, when you were going into Red, uh -huh. what was the inspiration behind that? Because I know you said, you know, you had Blade Runner and Hardwired for the first game, probably 2020. Red's obviously different. Red evolved out of necessity. What basically happens in any kind of game, or to be honest, in almost any type of, of uh, story arc, is that you eventually expand beyond the borders. Either, you know, the monsters are all killed or you have a way to get rid of the big bad or your heroes are too big or just everybody's been there before. They've all walked around Lothlorien and gone, yeah, okay, there's there's fish and elves. So you have to change up your environment. So Red came about when I and uh, some of the older Tarasaurian crew, including my, my good friend Dave Ackerman hiding over there behind the booth, um, <laughs> we decided we had to go shift things so we had more exciting and new things. So we looked at it and we said, hey, we got this corporate war going on. Let's just make it really ugly. Let's, let's you know, sit down and make it big time. Uh, the fourth corporate war was kind of modeled loosely off of World War II if we ignore the Japanese yeah. side of it. 
and it was what happens when multinational corporations are big enough to fight at least at the level of, let's say, France and England. So we blew things up in Night City so that Johnny and his friends, who are all really dominant characters, were now out of the way. And we did it in a way where, you know, you don't really know what happened in the end. Um, we also got rid of a lot of the big corporations because by that point most people said, yeah, we fought our Osaka, we defeated our Osaka. That's like saying I beat up Godzilla, what's the point? No. Yeah. So red comes from the background of a world where people take back power and they actually have a chance to win and the resolution doesn't really come about until we see 77. Now if if 2077 hadn't happened, yeah. do you think you would have gone in the same direction with Red? or would it uh, I was headed in the same general direction. It just was, it, it's really been weird working with C4, yeah, because what happens is we kind of think a lot of the same ways. So they were going, how do we keep things sort of like, you know, the side point everybody likes? And I'm going, meanwhile, how can I keep the things people like but, you know, scale it down so it's like not everybody has a Malorian and, you know, a silver chrome art. So we talked about a lot of this stuff and the process, you know, is, is taking years to kind of evolve where we want to go. But we're really happy with what we've got right now. I know before you were talking about how you kind of, when you gave it over to CD Projekt Red, they were kind of doing like a fanfic, I think is what you called it. Was it, was it really? Was it, I'm sorry, guys. I didn't mean that. <laughs> I mean, was it hard to kind of give your IP to somebody, to kind of like trust them with your baby to do something uh, like that? Or? I've been around this, this situation a lot. There have been other, many other companies and publishers who wanted to do Cyberpunk over the years. The thing about the CD project guys was we went over there and, you know, I didn't know what to expect. We hadn't seen anything they'd done. They said, we'll fly over, introduce yourselves and all that. And... I went over and I sort of expect they'd be this little tiny company and I'd you know, be nice and then we'd take off and they might do something. And I walked into this really well set up organization that was better than most of the project groups I'd been on in bigger places like Microsoft. And I went, damn, you know, why, why didn't we have you back when you know, I had to go organize for these groups? So basically, you don't mind leaving your kid with a babysitter that things pretty much like you do, and you trust to not drop the kid, <laughs> yeah. and it's also been a process of handing the baby back and forth between us. So there are things I step in and go, yeah, I really want to have this, or they step in and go, this is really important. And a lot of times it's negotiable, case in point. You know, my original conception of Johnny Silverhand wasn't, you know, uh, dark-haired Keanu Reeves. Yeah. He was actually based originally off kind of David Bowie. But, well, David Bowie was kind of busy in heaven or something. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, the thing was, what was important was, did you get the right feel for Johnny? This is a man who is kind of cold-blooded in some levels because he's lost a lot, and he thinks the world is really screwed up, and he really doesn't want it to be like that. And so he's going to use every tool at his disposal to turn it around. And that part we both agreed on. So coming to me and saying, well, you know, we have Keanu, you know, what do you think? I'm going, well, you know, it's not who I physically imagine, <laughs> but he's nailing what I want to see Johnny be like, you know. And he made that splash at E3 that, <laughs> yeah, that, that blew up. That was really funny. We knew for about three months before that he was on board. What we didn't know is how they were going to do the reveal on it. And, Everybody at CD was kind of saying, you know, who knew about it, because there were a bunch of guys who didn't know about it. And everyone's kind of going, yeah, we just want to surprise you. Yeah, we're going to surprise you. And he walks out after the, the uh, cut from the trailer. I didn't know about the cut from the trailer. I'd seen his mocap stuff, but I had not seen the build on that mocap. So he did actual mocap for it? He did, yeah, yeah. I, I had seen Keanu Reeves running around, you know, at least on film, in a mocap suit. Pretty, have you met him yet? I know you no, said you hadn't met him I have yet. not met him yet. Uh, I, I, I'm looking forward to it. Sooner or later, I think we'll probably cross paths. But uh, at the time when he was recording mocap, I was actually on the other side of the planet. And then when we were both in L.A., it was crazy. There was yeah. just no way for any of us to meet. You know. So we'll see. 
Yeah. You know, I, I expect it's going to happen more towards like, you know, closer to launch, really, that probably will be in the same place. Yeah. If, if, if you had made the game, say it was you that made Cyberpunk 27, would you have cast an actor in the role, or do you think you would have made somebody like I would original? Ass- I would assume they could get the actor. I w- okay, it's like Morgan Blackhand. You know, I don't know who CD would want to do necessarily, but I, I always tell them, Morgan is like, not what you think he is, you know. Morgan is, I, I'd say Morgan looks like a guy who sells insurance. And my personal choice has always been George Clooney. Weirdly enough, you know, in that he's good looking, but not super good looking. He's got presence, but he can be kind of amusing and in the background. And a guy like that can, you know, walk through a crowd, you know, carry his briefcase and seem kind of innocuous until, like, he quietly walks by and guts you. And that's all, you know, Morgan is a kind of a happy warrior who isn't that happy and isn't that visible for what he is. So, but, you know, my... My picture of us getting George Clooney to star as Morgan. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, but you know, I, I would have said that about Keanu. You yeah. know, I was like, what the heck? Yeah. I know we figured it. You know, we got it all worked out. And I kind of went, how did we do that? You know. So yeah, that was fairly crazy. Did, would you, who would you picture for like Alt Cunningham? Who would that have been in your mind? Oh, uh, geez. The original Alt Cunningham is actually based off a famous model of that period named Carol Alt. And that was, and Cunningham came from another friend of mine, and uh, Alt came from Carol Alt, because what I what I love the idea was that Alt is basically masses of honey blonde hair, gorgeous looking, all that. What most people don't know in her backstory is that Alt was kind of like that mousy girl who studied programming, and basically at a certain point she got her first big computer job, and, you know, Somebody said, you need to get rid of those glasses, girl. Really? Yeah. My <laughs> God, look at those violet eyes, you know. Yeah. And I always love the fact that, you know, basically everyone misses that Alt is a freaking genius. She's a brilliant programmer. But they're always going, oh, my God, look how amazingly hot she is. You know, and I, I love the fact that no one unwraps the package. Yeah. Just like, you know, I've, I've talked to people before who've gone like, well, you know, Alt is the, you know, uh, she's the, the uh, damsel in distress. I'm going, you really didn't read Never Fade Away. <laughs> Never Fade Away, they kidnap her. And while Johnny Gale's people together to rescue her, she wakes up, finds she's kidnapped, figures out a way to hijack the program, kill everybody in the room, steal several million dollars from them, and is about to go back to her body when her boyfriend comes in and says, hey, babe, I'm here to save you, <laughs> and screws it up. You know, and you're like, eh, yeah, no. Well, you know, all did not need rescuing. Yeah. But, and the thing is that they're kind of a tragic relationship because neither of them really understands each other real well. Now, I know it came out recently that you have a role in Cyberpunk 2077. I can't tell how, you what I was going to say, how much, you can't say anything I at all? I can't say anything. Okay, okay. That's Part fine. of it is because I'm learning about it as well. Yeah. Uh, Patrick uh, Mills, who's out here somewhere around our booth, is my... Uh, CDPR contacted Bud and he and I, you know, basically to coordinate everything he has been assigned as part of the story and mission team to work with me to make sure everything kind of lines up and so he's out here and we're lining things up, you know, as well as he's having a good time hanging in the booth but um, Patrick said, yeah, you know, we got to start getting things ready and I'm going, so what am I going to be doing? He says, yeah, I can't quite tell you that yet so, you know, I'll find out yeah. My, my joke now is that, you know, they're going to have some point where Keanu is, is Johnny playing and I'm going to walk on the stage with my bass yeah. and start playing with him. <laughs> but I don't think it's going to happen. That, that would be awesome, but... Yeah. The, Bob Smith brought his Conrad. Yeah, okay, let's get down. <laughs> so let's go back to Red a little bit. Um, with 2020, there are a lot of source books. Do you plan on doing uh, yes. quite a few for Red? Yeah, too? the answer is... Well, that's the great part. My, my business manager said it best yesterday. She was explaining to somebody, and she said, all these books here, and she reached out and pointed out all of the 2020 books, she said, are your history for Red. They're all things that happened in the past of Red. So if you have a Chromebook, that thing existed in Red. You just have to figure out where we put it. <clears throat> and one of the fun parts about Red is that all of the technology and weird things we had are there, but they're 
very unevenly and weirdly distributed. One of the big points of cyberpunk is the, the unequal distribution of power and technology, but that technology at a certain level becomes so um, ubiquitous that even you know the poorest guy can get technology because it's easy, it's cheap, you can find it anywhere. I, I was in uh, Brazil a bunch of years back, and I was amazed. I looked up the favela, and you know these guys are living in packing crates, right? But they're satellite dishes and TVs, and you can see the lights in the favela of all the TV sets, and you know they're big widescreen TVs, you know, yeah. and they've got sat dishes because the tech is relatively cheap. So I may not be able to eat. I may be eating rice and beans, but I have a really great TV. Well, in red, what happens is the means of distributing that gets blown up, just totally destroyed. So what happens is suddenly anybody, including the poorest person and the richest person, have an equal chance of getting to that stuff. So all of a sudden, you don't have to be you know, a really rich guy to have access to you know, certain body mods or other technologies. You, know, you just have to be in the right place. So you got... Today, I just learned of the Friday Night Firefight, like yeah. the kind of miniatures board game. Mm -hmm. Yep. Do you, can you tell me anything about it? Like, uh, Friday Night Firefight was developed by uh, one of our staffers, uh, and James is uh, one of these really wonderfully methodical, likes to do the numbers. He's our, we, we joke that he's the numbers guy at Cal, because he's always checking our math. And what it is, it's driven by a, a car driving system. It is theoretically collectible and expandable. You have four maps and you work on those maps and the environments change based on that. And then you can play different, all the different character types and that influences how things go down. Some things are valuable to one type but not to others. Some advantages and movement things happen with both types or all types. So the great part about FNFF is it's really fast to play. You know, you can have a really fun game in like you know five ten minutes setup is like screamingly fast maybe a minute so it's addictive and you play it you go okay you won that one now i'm gonna go you know use the net run i'm gonna mess you up and then you know somebody grabs another one or we're both gonna be net runners now let's see what happens and with all of the different types of characters you can play and how they play the various combinations of effects gives you a game that is fast but really interestingly complex you know, my, really my introduction to Cyberpunk was through the Netrunner mm -hmm. Watsi game that came out, the card yep. game. Yep. And so I see that, I don't know if you know too much about the Simon game that's coming out for yeah, Cyberpunk yeah. 2077. Do you know anything I know a bit about, about it? it. Yeah. Have you got to play it or anything? No, or? no, no. We're in totally different ends of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, do you know anything about the minis? Like, when are those, you know, any kind of release date or anything? For about these? The mini? Yeah. Uh, actually, that's what I'm, I'm afraid of with late to your meeting was we were just settling on mini dates because uh, over at, uh, sorry, I just, Monster Fight Club. Over yeah. at Monster Fight Club, uh, their art director just met with my art director, the nice lady in the chair over there, and uh, they have been working out exactly how to set the packages up. So we've already got all our figures we want to do. We're actually adding a bunch of cool ones that we decided in the last you know, couple of weeks. Now, that would be great if we added that. And so uh, I don't have an exact date, but actually pretty soon. And we'd actually like to try to, you know, have F and F, F for example, you know, ready, you know, for the Christmas season. That would be fun. And I think, you know, we got a shot of doing it. Are you going to make like some gangers and stuff too, like the yeah, we got, gangs and the miniatures? Yeah, there's going to be all kinds of stuff in there, and including some absolutely wild and weird things that, you know, because of our, our hookup with 77, um, there are things that nobody knows are coming that will be part of the evolution of the video game as well. With uh, Cyberpunk 2077, when people play the game, mm -hmm. they're probably going to want to play in that world. Yes. Are you going to do maybe a source book for Red, Cyberpunk 2077, or would you do that as like a different game? Yeah, yeah. If, you know, the, we're basically setting up right now to do the 77 game. And it's going to be a separate game, but it's going to have the same matching rule set. The idea is kind of like Star Trek or uh, Star Wars, and that there are basically three main periods 
One of them is the 2013 to 2020 period, which is kind of like high cyberpunk. You know, it's, it's the real flashy sort of cyberpunk. Then red fills in another section, which is the deconstructed cyberpunk. And then we travel forward into 77, which is another glitz, but a different style. So th there's a really great uh, group of pictures that CD did that d define each of our periods and how we dealt with them. So what that means is your character um, needs to have an individual book for the period you want to be in. It, it would be like saying, okay, um, we're going to give you Empire Strikes Back, but we're not going to give you any Star Wars, and we're not going to give you the rules. So the rules are in all of the books. Okay. Is there any release window for when the core rulebook is going to come out? Uh, I have a partner we work with whose mantra is it'll be ready when it's ready. <laughs> and since yeah. they, we are putting together a lot of stuff together, um, it still remains it'll be ready. But, you know, we got most of it hammered. So it's basically, we're fine-tuning. So it shouldn't be that long. Okay. Um, I'll kind of wind down. Is there any progress on Necton? I know, I think Mechton. I watched the seminar last year, and uh, you said yeah. kind of by the end of the year, but that's with the what craziness, happened, you know. Yeah, what happened was we did not expect Cyberpunk 2077 to blow up like it did, yeah. and especially last year, the way it blew up. Just wham, wow, everybody wants this thing. Whoa, we thought we'd be popular. You know, I, I want to invent a new title. It's like not a AAA title, but a, like a 5A title for this thing. It's scary. So what happened was, I, I actually have most of Zero stuff there. It's sitting in our warehouse. I've got dice, I've got figures, I've got t-shirts, I've got this. Um, but we had to go move our resources into red because red has to happen before we do 2077. So we had to suddenly move everything over to that time frame. And originally, you know, red had not even been on a schedule until we started talking about how we united things. So as a result, I realized I won't be able to do justice to what I want to do with Mekton. I love Mekton. So we paid everybody to Kickstarter back. And then we went ahead and said, look, when we get, you know, get everything run out again, everything's set, we'll call you and we'll send you a copy because you've earned it. Yeah. You know, and we were able to, you know, basically swallow that cost. It wasn't that, you know, bad at all for us. So we kind of said, yeah, you know, we're, we're going to swallow this because we, we wanted to get this to you. We didn't get to you when we hoped. Yeah, you know, what you did with that Kickstarter is really commendable because oh, thank you. a lot of, you know, a lot of companies, they do something and they just kind of, they don't give any updates and it's just gone, you know. We so. were kind of, well, that was what taught, taught me that we had to change that because, you know, we were giving updates as fast as I could get, but I wasn't able to give a lot of good updates because, you know, I'd well, you know, what are you guys doing? Uh, coming back from Poland? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm on a plane. Mike is on a plane. I am over the Atlantic. Yeah. Mekton. I have no idea right now. Yeah. So I guess I'll close out by um, a lot of new people are going to be getting their hands on the Cyberpunk Red Jumpster Kit. Yep, I hope so. so. Well, I know so. We, yeah. we have been You've just astounded at the sales. Yeah, you sold out like every day so far, right? Yeah, yeah. In fact, we've had to find ways to kind of hold back because so that people on Sunday will actually have copies. So we're hiding copies now, you know, just some back. <laughs> yeah. And we brought, you know, something in order of like five times what we brought for Witcher's rollout. And it was gone. It was insane. I came in, as soon as the doors opened, I came in, there was already a line all the way down the wall. For yeah, it's like all the way down the wall. And I, which are we had maybe two booth areas down the wall. And this is like, man, I can't see the end of that. You know, we're, we're sending people down, you know. So, yeah, basically um, what we've ended up doing is we, we'll have it on the market, you know. Uh, our printer, unfortunately, that's putting all this together and all that, they are basically on the East Coast, and there's no way we could get more in time for the show. You know, the, by the time it's all assembled, you know, they're set up so that we will be able to deliver it to distribution and retail really soon. And that way, those of you who haven't been able to get a copy of it, believe me, we're getting out to you real fast. You know, I'm gonna get back in, we're gonna be looking at proofs. And you're saying ship or whatever. So, what advice do you have to say, like uh, somebody who picks it up 
and they're afraid to GM or run a game? Like, what kind of advice would you give to somebody like that? I was actually fascinated by that. Uh, we got a reviewer in the other day who said, this is, you know, I don't even play tabletop. And this is the first tabletop I just figured I could get in and just do. We've given you a lot of clues on how to run. We've given you characters and encounter stuff. We've given you kind of all the pieces of how the world goes together. I wrote sections on like what characters can do, what their day-to-day -day lives are, what the slang, you know, basically really immersive stuff. And the rules are much simpler. Um, for those of you who worry about the idea that we won't have some of the complexity that we had in the original Cyberpunk rules, what we've done is we've kind of designed it so that there are easy paths to do certain things and then more advanced paths to those same things. And they mesh together. You can go back and forth if you want. And so, for example, we have a really great system that we invented for generating a character with one die roll that works great. You can't roll a bad character. But that system is scaled and numbered so that you could also do the uh, point-based system of the old game and build it from scratch. So we tried to keep a world that works for both the old players and our old fans and also is accessible to the new fans as well. Because there's you know, a lot of those people out there who've never seen it or they've come through video games and are you know, going to want to learn how to do this on their own and you know, people commented that there's some things that we you know, have brought back from the old game. And yes, we have to do that because you know, old players know this. You know, um, guys in CDPR can like quote stuff at me now. <laughs> but all the new guys have to learn it too. So we have to make it accessible to them as well. So sometimes you got to repeat so you can get new friends. All right. So the Jumpstart Kit is available on Drive-Thru RPG right now. I'll link that in the description. The core rule book is ready when it's ready. And so but that's... Soon. Yep. Soon. When it's ready. All right. I'll see you guys later. All right.